Good morning. This is Adam Fletcher, and in this, the fifth installment of my series on re-envisioning the roles of young people throughout society, I'm going to talk about the history of Youth Voice in the United States. Youth Voice has a long history that is tantamount to this country's very existence, uh, extending all the way from the time of the earliest years of the country's founding. Um, Youth Voice has been a force that has been um, powerful throughout the history of the country. In 1665, a Puritan minister said that surely there is in all children a stubbornness, a stoutness of mind arising from natural pride, which must in the first place be broken and beaten down so that the foundation of their education be laid in humility and tractableness, and other virtues may in their time be built thereon. We have in that statement a foundation for the future oppression of young people that we're still experiencing to this day. However, an exciting thing arises in history as well, and, it, and I think that that's an awareness of the power of young people. Benjamin Franklin, uh, I'm sorry, Thomas Jefferson said that the boys of this generation are the men of the next, the sole guardian of the principles we deliver to them. So in this idea comes that notion that uh, youth are the leaders of tomorrow, it, it was, which was a high-minded ideal for that time, especially, I believe. We had a phenomenon where there was a young country that was being born and a foundation that was being laid for an economic system, a religious system, and a variety of other elements that continue to this day to inform and drive this country's very existence. Um, and that foundation is, was really reliant on the energy and strength of youth. Now there was a particular kind of awareness among the early colonists in the United States of the uh, democracies of the Native American tribes, especially in the Northeast. In the book 1492, I'm sorry, in the book 1491, the author talks a lot about um, the early Native American democratic societies uh, of the Iroquois and the other of uh, the seven allied nations in the Northeast. And one of the things, though, that, that isn't frequently drawn out in the histories was the actual age of the participants in those um, different communities that existed. And we'll never necessarily know much about those ages. Because in those early Native American tribes, age didn't factor in as being a relevant condition for leadership. Instead, it was seen as ability. Uh, the ability to successfully lead people, the ability to successfully um, maneuver the different jobs within their societies that existed at that point. Whether they were hunting or um, agriculture or land management or any of the other um, sophisticated elements of uh, ensuring that a society existed and thrived at that in those early years. So those Native American communities had um, perhaps not not defeated adultism in so much as they didn't they didn't have it. It didn't exist per se uh, how we're used to it. That said, there was an early tension in European settlements in the United States because of that awareness that age was one of the predominant factors of success. Early settlements really relied on young people, both to um, be the actual drivers of the societies um, and to carry forth the ideals of the societies. So we had elements like um, entire occupations that were built on the shoulders of young people. 14, 15 year olds who were apprentices when they were kids in England came to the United States or the early colonies in America and uh, they actually became the blacksmiths, they actually became the textile um, managers um, and inherited the mantle of their early labors. Another tension that existed in those early European settlements was this whole idea that um, the politics of a place wasn't necessarily dependent on a person's age. And again, this isn't something that time has really recorded very well, but we know that young people served a variety of roles throughout the politics of those early years. So we have these roots of oppression, but at the same time, an acknowledgement of ability. As the, the young United States started growing west, there was a real reliance on young people to become the settlers, um, the European settlers of the lands that they stole from the Native American tribes. And so there was an awareness among a lot of um, the companies and organizations that were promoting westward uh, movement, as well as the government, that young people were an essential part of that role. 
Starting with the development of northwestern New York, upstate New York, and all of New England, young people played roles such as school teachers, business owners, shopkeeps, uh, blacksmiths, and uh, many other essential roles throughout the community. This only continued as the United States moved west in its westward expansion, and of course continued to push out the Native American tribes. Simultaneously, young people were essential also in uh, the freeing of slaves from the bondage uh, that they ex that uh, existed with the, with the African slaves particularly, but also with indentured servants from Europe. In the book, The Boys' War, uh, which was written by uh, Jim Murphy, um, we have the stories of more than 20 people under the age of 18 um, who basically made the, and, and what the author makes the case for in this book is that uh, the Civil War was really fought on the backs of children, uh, as young as eight and nine years old, who were active frontline soldiers. And this wasn't just a phenomenon, it was actually a trend, a pattern that emerged in a notable percentage of the troops on both sides of the war. So that's uh, The Boys' War, it's by Jim Murphy, and uh, the copyright in it is um, 1990. So that book is probably on Amazon. So we have these examples that are emerging. Another really great source for information about the history of youth voice in the United States is a book by a man named Philip Hoos called We Were There Too, Young People in U.S. History. Hoos also wrote another book um, about uh, youth involvement, but his book, this book came out in 2001, We Were There Too, Young People in U.S. History, and basically tells the story of dozens of youth who were essential uh, in different local histories and as well as the national history in the United States. Another source that I found to be pretty useful um, for this early history in the United States and actually expanding into today is a book simply called Childhood in America. Um, and the editors of this are Paula F. Bass and Marianne Mason. Uh, this book just came out in the early thousands. But you can see it's not necessarily a book for everybody. It's well over 500 pages, actually 725. So, unless you're a big nerd like me, you uh, probably want to skip that one. I have a short history of Youth Voice in the United States that I am finishing up writing right now. I've been working on it for the last couple of years. It's kind of interesting. Um, I'll let you know when that comes out. This is part one of three different parts that I'm going to do on the history of Youth Voice in America. Um, here I've kind of sketched out what that early component of the history of Youth Voice in the United States is. The foundations in the Native American communities building upon it with the settlement of um, the United States and some of those roots both of the oppression of young people and for the relief of that oppression uh, and an awareness of the essential role that young people played throughout our society uh, by early uh, founders of the United States such as Thomas Jefferson. Next I'll expand and talk about the late 1800s where some really exciting action uh, came to the forefront around labor activism and the emergence of youth as an essential component not only of the economic cycle but actually of the social change cycle. Join me next time uh, as we continue this exploration and learn more about me and my work at www.bicyclingfish.com. Thanks and have a great day.